personal and informal manner of Bible study. Lord willing, we will be coming to you Thursday at 5 to 6 p.m. and repeated Tuesday at 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. each week here on Cable 10. We invite you now to join us with your Bible, pen, and paper. Consider the words of God. Jot down important scriptures and any questions that come to mind. Most importantly, learn the Bible for yourself. And now, your Bible teacher. Good evening. Once again, what a joy it is for, our, for us to come into your home. Our hearts are thrilled with this privilege. I'm Dr. Clock, the host of the first portion on the Way of Life program. Very shortly, Alice will be singing for us. And the message and song which she has for us this evening is, I'd rather have Jesus. I trust that you will listen uh, very carefully to those precious words and message and song. Uh, they're just lovely. And then Stephen will be the host to the second portion of the Way of Life. And we just trust that uh, our fellowship this evening with you in your home will be that which will bless your heart, encourage you, and will be an honor and glory to our wonderful Lord. And should you not know our precious Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus is your Savior, may this be the reality for your dear hearts tonight. And you can go through 1989, or as long as the Lord might give you this privilege for 89, knowing that you're saved and that you have a wonderful person to live with and to walk with and then to meet if he should return this year for us there in the air. I trust that we'll get back on our next uh, Way of Life program, as far as my part, on the continued study of the church in the book of Ephesians. But we've just felt burdened to take a little time out and to emphasize the best we know how, trusting that the Lord will take this truth and make it real to your heart the necessity of really knowing whether you're born again or not, really knowing that you have eternal life, and observing some of the emphatic teachings that we have in the Word of God regarding this. And so, to that end, we invite you to take your Bibles this evening and uh, pick it up wherever it might be, run across a room and, and take it off the mantel or maybe on the stand uh, and open it, if you will, with me to the Gospel of John. <clears throat> John chapter 1, just a couple of verses that we would like to share with you this evening as we continue on with the great necessity of knowing that you have eternal life. Verses 12 and 13. Two verses that I'm sure most of you on the Way of Life program know and have enjoyed and rejoice over uh, many, many years. Let me begin reading with verse 12. <clears throat> but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Now you recall the last time that we were with you on the Way of Life program, we emphasized that portion in 1 John chapter 5, verse 12. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. See, a person does not have eternal life. He is not saved unless he possesses a person. You must have the Lord Jesus as your own personal precious Lord and Savior. And if you do not have a person, not a doctrine, not a creed, although there's a doctrine and there's a great creed about him, if that's all you have, friend, you're not saved. You've got to have a person, the Lord Jesus, as your Savior, and you must possess him, or you do not have eternal life. And I suggest for you, there's no better time to take spiritual inventory of your life than right now. And if you have not, if you have not received him, do it, won't you, right now. Or during this time that we fellowship together in the word of the Lord. Now then, let's look rather carefully at 
John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. Now in so doing, I want to quote another passage of Scripture in the fifth chapter of the Gospel of John, which I've also given a number of times on the way of life. The Lord Jesus speaking to a group of folk that he knew they were not saved. He knew that they didn't have eternal life. And yet they were very religious. They were people who ascribed to the teaching of the Word of God. Now this is something that just burns me in the sense of a burdened heart for people. And we travel among people primarily who love the book, who love the message of the Word of God. But I'm so afraid, so afraid, that many of them who hear the Word of the Lord, that's all they have is the message of the Word of the Lord as they've heard it, but it has not sunk into their heart. And the Lord Jesus states this to that group of people that loved to study the Word, and He said this, John chapter 5, Search the Scriptures, for in them and the Scriptures you think you have eternal life. They are they which testify of me, but you won't come to me. Did you hear that? Jesus says, you won't come to me that you might have life. Now those are the words from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ as he walked upon the face of this earth. And the divine imperative was that they might come to a person. And as First John states, they might have a person. They might possess a person, the Lord Jesus. Yes, study your Bible, friend. Read it. It's a good thing to do. But friend, it's more than just having an intellectual attainment of the truth here. It's got to do something for your life. It's got to do something to your heart. And that is, it's to introduce you to the person of the Lord Jesus. And what are you going to do with that introduction? All right, let's see in the 12th verse of the first chapter. My Bible tells me something very important with reference to the introduction of the Lord Jesus. As many as received Him. Now, this happens to be a lot different than that, pr that present participle that we noticed in 1 John 5, where it says the present par participle having, that's doherty, that is linear action, that's continuous action. Now then, this particular verb here, in John chapter 1 is a verb that we call an aorist tense. This looks at an act. You don't continue to receive him, absolutely not. It is an act. And the act is, the uh, uh, aorist tense, is that you receive once and for all time a person. Now then, the Bible tells us that there's divine authority given to the person who will receive as an act the Lord Jesus. That divine authority is that he might become a born child of God. Technon's the Greek word here. And the very moment a person will receive Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ in light of who Jesus Christ is, as revealed in the word of the Lord. As he said, the scriptures testify of me. All right? It's Jesus Christ in light of the revelation of the word of God. Those who will receive him will have, uh, the Bible says, he might have the authority to become the born child of God. Now then, <clears throat> how do I receive him? And this is such an interesting change in tense. Notice what it says. To those who are believing in his name. Now did you get the difference with reference to the tense? As many as received him. An act. Okay. How do I receive him? How do I? The Bible tells me right here... It is by believing. Now this is a present tense. All right. 
let's stop for a moment and see if we can explain things. First, <clears throat> the Bible says, in order to have Jesus, I've got to receive Him. Isn't that what we've noticed? As far as 1 John chapter 5, and as far as John chapter 1 here, is if I have Him, I've got to receive Him. That's how I come to Him. As Jesus says, you won't come to me. Well, I will come to Him, you say. I've come to Him. I've come to Him by receiving Him as an act, once and for all, done. Now then, I'm told what that receiving is. And this is so important. To those, to those, now this is a restrictive participle, those who believe in His name. Now the word believing here is in the present tense. It looks at action that continues to go on, doesn't stop. It's not an act. It is a continuous reality. And so, the Bible is clearly teaching us now how that I can have the Lord Jesus is when I will receive Him. Receiving Him is by believing in Him, and that believing in Him continues on. One's going to say, oh yeah, but what if I do not continue to believe? The Bible doesn't know anything about that kind of belief. Only that is man's concocted doctrine. Now, I'll tell you what will take place. If a person says, well, I've believed, but then he falls into sin. And someone's going to say, well, if you fall into sin, you don't believe any longer. Now, listen, friend, you want to be careful at that point, because that's nothing but rationalism. My Bible tells me that a believer, a believer, one who's received Christ and knows that he's saved, and continues to believe if he falls into sin, there are a number of things which take place. First of all, there's a danger of really being spanked by the Lord. You see, our Heavenly Father chastens us. As the book of Hebrews tells us, that He, scour he chastens and scourges every son whom He receives. And if you be without chastisement, then you are illegitimate, and you're not a son of God. You don't belong to Him. You're not born again by God. And you're not in His family. So if you are an individual who says you believe, and you're living in sin, and you're not receiving the chastening and scourging hand of God, you better be careful because you may just have nothing but a profession, and you're illegitimate spiritually. You are a stillbirth spiritually. You don't have the eternal life. Now then, there's another thing as far as the teaching of the Word of God is concerned. And this is likewise found in 1 John chapter 5. There's such a thing as sin unto death. This is also, I believe, found in 1 John, I'm sorry, John chapter 15, about verse 6. That uh, the individual who continues, a Christian now, a believer who continues to live in sin, you are in danger of being put to death and taken out of this life, and God will do that. And I'm firmly convinced that there's a whole lot more of sin unto death than we are willing to recognize. We'll just simply pawn it off, well, such and such a person died, and etc. Well, they died all right. But as far as a Christian is concerned, why did they die? Now, you've got to be careful that you don't say that e the death of every Christian is the chastening hand of God. He's taking him home. No, that's not the case. The sin, as far as sin unto death, is sin which is recognized as sin by believers because that passage in 1 John chapter 5 goes on to say this. If any brother anyone see his brother sinning sin that's not unto death, he should pray for him. And 
perchance that he might give him life. So it is a matter of a believer or a Christian that is walking in sin. All right, now we pray for that individual that he'll repent of that sin and uh, confess it and God will clean him up. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to do what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness, restore that individual to the place of fellowship, to a life of fruitfulness, walking with his Lord. Now here are some things that are sort of sidelights with reference to this matter of believing. But as far as the Bible is concerned, I have received the Lord Jesus the very moment I placed my faith in Jesus Christ according to the witness of the Word of God. I trust in Him, in the person of Jesus. Now listen to Acts chapter 4. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby it is imperative or necessary for us to be saved. So you see, it is the Jesus of the Bible, the Jesus who was born of a virgin, the Jesus who was born according to the Scriptures, the Jesus who was so named by the angels in heaven, and Mary and Joseph affirmed such. It is that person and only that person. He says, I am the way, I'm the door. No other one can come to the Father except by me. All right, now listen. You see, believing is receiving. Now then, there is the act. That one act of reception, the very moment I began to place my heart's faith in Christ. Now then, a, a person who is truly born again is the one who continually has that heart of faith in Jesus Christ. That's what this tense is teaching us. And you will go all the way through the Gospel of John, and you will find that this is true. I remember some years ago teaching some of my students Greek, and uh, one of those students came up to me afterwards, and he said, I've been noticing something very interesting in the Gospel of John. And that is, time and time again, where it talks about believing, it's always in the present tense. Is how come it's in the present tense and does not look at that matter as far as an act is concerned. It's just simply this. A person who believes and trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ, that is living faith. That faith continues on and on and on. If a person says he believes and then stops believing, well, that kind of belief is not biblical belief. That belief is heretical belief. That belief is a doctrine of man. And... Uh, the Bible knows nothing of that kind of faith at all. No, none whatsoever. Once you've trusted in the Lord Jesus, you're going to continue to trust that. And this is one of the reasons why I am so uh, scared, if I can use that term, for individuals who profess to be saved. Because as far as the manifestation of that life is concerned, why, it's not a life that is conducive to the reality of what the Bible calls a life of faith. Now, this is serious business. And I'm not trying to scare you in the sense of making you doubt your salvation, but I certainly am endeavoring to bring you to the place of some right down, uh, straight, old-fashioned uh, uh, inventory as to whether you're saved biblically. And if you're not, you ought to get squared away from the biblical point of view. Now then, let's go on to verse 13, which gives to us the great, great work of God with reference to this business of receiving the Lord Jesus and having, if you please, the faith that continues on. Now, now before I go to that, let me just remind you that in the book of James, we have mentioned there that the devils also believe, but they believe and tremble. Now you see, the devils, they're not saved at all. Absolutely not. There's all kinds of demonic forces, and they're perfectly aware of the reality of Almighty God. Well, they're not saved. But listen, 
you have to be careful of the word belief because if you're going to say, well, I can believe and that's all there is to it, you may not be any better off than the devils. You may be headed straight down uh, the garden path uh, for eternity being lost. Now, I, I hope that's not the case. But now let's look at the great consequences of the type of belief that the Bible is talking about here in John chapter 1. And this is what is going to result the very instant of true belief or true reception of the Lord Jesus. Who are born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man. Now, here's an exclusion of all human effort. The physical birth doesn't have anything to do with it. The activity of the flesh has nothing to do with it. Uh, the activity of the will of man. Now, that's, that's, that's uh, kind of a stickler there. It's not in contradiction to the exercise of the will of man. But what you do have here is the matter of the volition of man who can control this business of being born again. Absolutely not, friend. I want to tell you, you don't control it. The third chapter of the Gospel of John affirms that. The wind blows where it listens. You hear the sound there, and you cannot tell where it comes or where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the sovereign work of the Spirit of God. Absolutely so. You and I meet the prerequisites that God has laid down. You hear the message of God. You hear the testimony of the Scriptures concerning Jesus Christ. Then are you willing in your heart to trust what you've heard about the person and to receive a person, the Lord Jesus if you are, that happens to be a work of God upon your will to trust Him. And it doesn't mean, oh, I don't feel like getting saved today. I think I'll get saved two hours from now. No, you don't, friend. Absolutely not. You don't control the activity of the Spirit of God. The Lord Jesus says, uh, uh, excuse me, the Word of the Lord says this, Behold, now is accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. When you hear the word, now's the time. No, sir, and if you put it off there, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, <laughs> you just harden in your heart just a little bit more. In a lot of Second, Cor uh, Second Corinthians chapter 2, those who preach the word of the Lord, those who preach the message, they're savor of life unto life and savor of death unto death. You see, our message if you don't trust in the Lord Jesus in light of the Word of God, it just becomes something that hardens your old godless heart just a little bit more for the purpose of judgment later on from the holy hand of Almighty God. Absolutely so. But now listen. Here is the great work of God. You're born not of anything which deals with humanity, but you're born out of God. Oh, how I love that. You see, friend, to receive Jesus, to believe in Jesus, to receive that person, the Spirit of God comes along and creates in you this great new life because at that moment, Jesus comes to dwell within, as the Bible says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. The Spirit of God comes to dwell within, and you have this wonderful eternal life, which is characteristic of the person of Jesus Christ Himself and the Trinity of glory. And as a result, the Bible tells us that you have been born again. Now, what is birth anyway? Birth is the beginning of life. Birth is that which has a vessel <coughs> to manifest life. Now, there's some very unfortunate things that take place within the framework of the physical, and that is sometimes little ones are born without any life. We call that stillbirth. They don't have life. They're born dead. 
Now, those little ones, uh, they, uh, we, we just have to put them away. We bury them because they're, uh, they're a dead entity of humanity. They can't live upon the face of this life. Now then, my Bible tells me that when you're born again spiritually, you become a born child of God and you manifest something. You manifest that wonderful life known as eternal life. And this body which you have becomes a vessel whereby this eternal life is expressed through it. Now, don't you see the importance of the manifested life of e uh, 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 the manifestation of eternal life? The person that says he's born again, the person who says he's saved, and this vessel does not manifest eternal life. Friend, put a question mark over it. And if you don't have any spiritual desire, the only thing that you have is a rabbit's foot that wants to keep you out of hell and a passport to heaven, you better get saved. You better know that Jesus is your Savior. Oh, friend, it, it, it's very important. It's imperative that you know that you have this wonderful, wonderful eternal life. If not, the Bible says, listen, receive Jesus by trusting in him who died for you, was buried, and rose again, the very Son of God. Won't you be saved, I trust so. Thank you. 